This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Uh, our guest is a veteran of TV and film. He's written shows like Fringe, West Wing, and Law and Order SVU, done by our one of our donors, Dick Wolf. You know, uh, Carsey Wolf Center runs the Pollock, and of course, he also wrote the film Fifth Estate. But we're here to talk Spotlight tonight. Uh, Spotlight has gotten six Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Supporting Actor, Mark Ruffalo, Best Supporting Actress, Regina George. You notice half the audience gets that reference. The other half is saying, no, it's actually Rachel McAdams from The Notebook. Uh, also, best editor, and of course, the best original screenplay. So please welcome to the Pollock Theater stage, screenwriter Josh Singer. Thanks. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks, uh, OK, so I hate to play the hardball interviewer, but we're going <laughs> to go with the tough question first. Right. How difficult was it write the research scenes where people, like the reporters, read books? <laughs> and like they, didn't, they couldn't hook it up to their iPad, and you couldn't do a Google search. Did you find that at all difficult, trying to relate to how they would do it old school? Uh, you know, uh, we actually sort of loved all of that. Uh, you know, we, we walked into the Boston Globe uh, library and we're, you know, the, or the very first time we went up to Boston, and they have, you see them in the movie, these little, it's this sort of carousel of, 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 card, of card boxes that sort of roll along as you press, like, oh, I want to look at this, you know, the peas, and it moves to the peas, and it's totally old school. And visually, that's incredible. You know, it's much better than, you know, Googling something, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, and a lot of microfiche and a lot of, you know, a, a lot of physical clips, like all that stuff. Uh, is actually much more tactile and, and, and much more stuff that we were excited to write to. Um, but, you know, I think from the very beginning, Tom had a real uh, vision of authenticity. He wanted to really get it right in terms of what reporters do and how they do it. I think it was par partially because, you know, uh, he had come from, you know, The Wire and had talked a lot with David Simon about the blue-collar nature of the job. Uh, and I had just spent, you know, uh, a couple of years researching, you know, reporters and spending time with the guys of The Guardian and, you know, really being impressed by, you know, what they don't do. You know, there aren't car chases. There aren't, you know, you know deep, dark voices in parking garages, you know, necessarily. Um, it's more just pounding the pavement and really, you know, dogged pursuit of lead after lead after lead. And sometimes it's literally just like Mike does with Mitch Garabedi and Mark Ruffalo and Stanley Tucci just hanging around for long enough that your source finally gives up, empties his pockets, as they would say. <laughs> so then, so let's say, so would you say more of the research was done interviewing the, uh, the, the, the Real Spotlight team, the victims, or just reading through the articles? How would uh, you? It was all, all the above. above. I mean, we, we, you know, I, uh, I originally spent about a week with Mike Resendez out here in, uh, in LA. Uh, I took him to lunch uh, at all my favorite places, uh, or, you know, Langer's Deli, for those of you who like pastrami. <laughs> there you go. We got a couple <laughs> Langer's fans in the audience. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the end of that week, I had sort of a 55-page Word document. It, you know, I basically had him walk me just through the entire story, um, you know, so I could really see all the ins and outs. And I knew there was a great procedural there, but then I went to Boston to sit with all the other uh, reporters. And at that time, Tom was just kind of direct, but you always want your director to get excited and be involved uh, because, you know, that way maybe your movie gets made. So I said, Tom, <laughs> who was in New York, do you want to come up to Boston with me? He said, sure. And we spent a week up there, and we talked to Marty and Robbie and Sasha and Matt and Ben and, and a couple others, you know, on the periphery of the story. Um, and at the end of that week, we were taking the train Amtrak back from Boston, and, uh, and Tom said, okay, great, when are we going back? And, you know, left to my own devices, I probably would have gone back, but I probably would have gone and thought a lot about, you know, what I had, you know, taken in. But 
he had an enormous appetite for research. And I'm pretty geeky myself. I went to law school and, you know, I love nothing more than, you know, doing research. And, you know, not to mention, you know, the longer you do research, you know, that's longer you can pr procrastinate. And as a writer, <laughs> anything you can do to stay away from the blank page is, you know, is, is a good thing. So, uh, so, you know, we just kept going to Boston and it turned out to be this great, you know, you know we talked to all the reporters multiple times. <clears throat> Almost everyone you meet in the movie we sat with. Uh, you know, I, I had a four hour dinner with Phil Saviano, which was incredibly, you know, uh, uh, illuminating. Uh, we sat with Joe Crowley and had a long dinner with him. Uh, I sat with Richard Seip for a long time. He's the fellow Richard Jenkins plays on the, on the, just on the speakerphone. Mm -hmm. Uh, lawyers, you know, uh, and they're actually, you know, Tom brought up last night, there were some folks we sat with who we couldn't get in. Uh, Larry Rasky and, and uh, Ann Carter, who had done PR for the Cardinal, and we thought they were really interesting. And it just all sorts of different perspectives that helped us flesh out the story. And while we were doing that, we started just bouncing on the story ourselves so that, you know, two, three months in, when Tom turned to me and said, well, do you mind if I write this with you? I said, well, we basically already are writing it together. Um, and, you know, sort of a very organic way to start, you know, collaborating. So it's sort of like you were collaborating like the Spotlight team. You know, we joked about that. And, you know, we're obviously not real reporters, but we were doing a fair bit of investigation because, you know, these guys, this had happened 10 years prior for these guys. Sometimes they're mazy, they're, they're, their memories were hazy. Uh, sometimes we had to jog their memories. Reporters are much better at asking questions than they are at answering questions. Um, and, uh, you know, and there were also some things that, you know, we discovered that maybe they didn't want us to discover along the way. Um, so it really did feel a little bit like we were investigating the investigation. Uh, and as you said, we did have to go back through the archives, which were incredibly useful because we were looking at the Porter case, which came before and everything that led up to uh, them breaking this story in 2002. And we were also looking at old emails. I mean, at some point on Tom's board, we literally had a, you know, okay, Marty starts on July 30th, you know, they meet with Phil the following Thursday, you know, they have 12 priests by this date, they then have on August 23rd, they sit with Marty and Marty says, because we actually have the email where Marty sends Robbie and Ben and said about our meeting yesterday, you know, you know, I'm not so much, you know, I just want to reiterate, I'm not so much interested in numbers of priests as I am in the system. And it's a great email and we took from that email and used it in the scene where Marty says that to them and we also then had a fixed date. And so that helped us with our procedural. It's one of the things I really like about Lee Schreiber's performance in Marty, where the outsider was needed to shine a spotlight on, get spotlight moving. Because he could have been the villain. If it was a real triple script, you know, the bit, the new boss who doesn't care, the outsider doesn't care, but he actually pushed it forward. Yeah, we, we thought a lot about outsiders and insiders here. Um, I, I think that um, one of the interesting things about uh, these sorts of stories, and something we were focused on early on, you know, is yes, the church was and I think still continues to be somewhat of a bad actor here, but there are all sorts of people who are enabling that bad action, right? Whether it's cops or lawyers or newspaper men. And, you know, some of this is who's the insider and who's the outsider. And the insiders who are used to this system tend to just let it keep going the way it has been. Whereas the outsiders, you know, are often pushed to the side. And if you look, you know, Marty's an outsider and he's the first one to say, hey, what's going on here? You've got Mitch Garabini, who's clearly an outsider in the legal perfection. He's an Armenian. He's not someone who's, you know, in the heart of the hub. Uh, you have Mike Resendez, who's a little bit of an outsider himself. And so there's a, there's a real tension between outsiders and insiders that we really try to hammer down on. Now, you've done all this wonderful research, but you got to turn to a screenplay. So you open with a terrific scene in the police station where the bishop actually is in control of the room at the time, dismissing the assistant DA. A great opening scene to set up the power of the Catholic Church, just visually in that moment where he just says, I'll be done in a minute. Did you always land on that as your opening? You know, it's funny because we, we had, you know, uh, in terms of structure, we had always thought we would start, you know, just a little bit before Marty starts. So you could sense the sort of uh, nervous anticipation, especially given that, Newspapers are just starting to have to cut their budgets, and we wanted to set that sort of stage. But we would go from there, you know, late July till the publication of the first story. And that scene you referenced was a, a, a something Tom added, you know, later. He was just noodling and said, "Well, what if we have something that is a bit of a tableau that shows, you know, shows our bigger themes right up front, right? Mm -hmm. So we can see, oh, there's the lawyer, the DA, and there the ADA, and there's the cops, and." 
how they're all going to sort of look the other way and how any one of us might have done the same thing in that situation, right? Who's going to cuff a priest, right? And so, you know, it was a scene that, you know, he wrote and then we thought, okay, how do we tie it in? And I said, oh, well, what if it's Gagan actually in there? So it has some tie, but it, it's not, you know, most times you see a scene like that in the Law and Order, for example, you know, it comes back around in a bigger way. Uh, but here we were hoping that it would be enough that just thematically it comes around and you'd have that tie-in because you, when you hear Gagan, you're like, oh, that's the guy we saw. Yeah. Well, when you set, I mean, you set up the power of the church, but practically every shot of the movie has a church in the background and the playground. Like, you're constantly reinforcing the influence. Yeah, and that, that's, that's something that we were really struck by, right? With, with you know, when we sat with Phil, uh, the first time I sat with Phil Saviano, he talked about how, you know, when you're a, uh, when you're in one of these small towns, the church is everything. Literally, the towns are built around the church in these smaller places in Massachusetts. And even in Boston, you can't go, you know, 10 steps without finding another church, right? It's so central, right? And so when these priests abuse these kids, these kids, it's like God abusing them. And suddenly their fate, not only is it physical abuse and emotional abuse, but it is spiritual abuse. They lose their faith. And it's not surprising that so many of these folks struggle so for the rest of their lives. Yeah, that, that, that actually, the scene was what he's saying, and when he talks about that, was very, the most painful for me. Uh, but it was interesting how all the other characters were either Catholic, recovering Catholics, uh, you know, dealing with that. But also, you're opening, you had to set up Spotlight. And I love Mark Ruffalo's line, it's, yeah, it's not a bad story, but it's just not Spotlight. Did you need, you wanted to re like immediately set up that Spotlight was the... Yeah, and, and, well regarded we, and I mean, we really wanted to set up what this team did and how it was somewhat special and, and distinct and different from your average beat reporter. And that's something, you know, that was another thing we really wanted to emphasize was, you know, the importance of newspapers and this kind of investigative journalism. Because over the last 15 years, you know, over a dozen Metro Dailies have gone out of business, you know, tens of thousands of reporters have lost their job. I'm from Philadelphia. You know, I was just there and, you know, the, the Inky just laid off 47 reporters in December. Right? When you've got 47 less reporters, that's 47 less reporters who are holding government and the powerful accountable. Right? And so we wanted to show the power of a team of four journalists to you know, break a local story, which turns out to be an international story, uh, and why that's so important. And I think that's best represented in the scene with Stanley Tucci, who's been dismissing Mark Ruffalo, then hears the word spotlight, right. and suddenly right. he turns and says, oh, okay, call me. Right, and, <laughs> yeah. it, and, it, and it's funny because it's, it's, a, it's a team that, you know, if you're outside of Boston, I mean, I, I went to college, uh, sorry, I went to grad school in Cambridge. I didn't know what the spotlight team is. You really, it's for Boston insiders who know what the spotlight team is, but those who know, I mean, they had a famous statement, which is that, uh, you know, uh, if the spotlight team is coming after you, it's going to be in your obituary. Um, so if you're involved in Spotlight, it's going to be in your obituary. So, uh, and uh, now I, I actually believe it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, let's break down a little of the characters. All right, so we'll start with Mike, because well, you referenced Mike and Mark Ruffalo before. So how much of it is that the real Mike? How much did you work with Mark maybe to kind of like refine it? How did you work with the two of them actually? I, I mean, I would say we spent a lot of time with all of these guys. I mean, we, we have, I have tapes and tapes, you know, of recordings uh, of uh, our sessions with them, probably 10 hours with each of them, and that's just for starters. And then we would, you know, call them and we would ask them questions. We got very familiar with them. Uh, and, you know, once we thought that this might be going forward, you know, once Mark had signed on board and Michael signed on board, you know, in 2014, we then uh, held our breath and sent them the script. Uh, and we're terrified, as you can imagine, you know, uh, what, what they were going to say. We actually sent it to Marty first because we thought he would be a little more objective and a little more removed, uh, and he was positive. And so then we sent it to the rest of them, and we got notes, and they all had notes, uh, not surprisingly. Um, <laughs> but they were good notes, and they were really useful. And in fact, not only did we incorporate their notes, but then we actually took uh, Mike and Robbie. We went to Boston, Tom and I. We sat in a room for six hours and went over every line of the script. Because we wanted to make sure every line in the script felt like it was a real line that newspaper reporters would say. And we had thought about hiring somebody else, but we got so close with Mike and Robbie, we thought, they, and they literally, it was great. You know, and we changed lines here and there, lingo, jargon. And that was so successful that we actually had Robbie up on set for probably 75% of the shoot. Oh, wow. uh, we had Mike, all the reporters were on set at some point or another, and Robbie, Mike, and Sasha spent an awful lot of time on set. 
Um, and it was invaluable. You it must know. have been great for the actors too, though. Yeah. Yeah, and and again, I think that goes a lot to Tom's vision. You know, Tom from the beginning was all about authenticity, uh, and and you know the actors, the crew, everybody picked that up. So when Mark started working, the first thing he did is he went and spent a week with Mike. Like literally went and followed him around for a week. You know, Mike likes to joke that you know you know Mark came into his apartment, which he doesn't you know have a lot of in you know, a small apartment, and you know Mark sat down and took out a tape recorder and opened up a, you know a, a pad and started asking questions. And Mike sort of felt like, well, oh, this is a little invasive, and then realized that that is what he had been doing for the last <laughs> twenty years. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, and 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 uh, you know. Robbie, same sort of thing, you know, tells this story about how, you know, the first time he sits down with Michael Keaton, you know, and they're talking and, you know, and, and Michael's listening a lot and then he notices it's almost like he's rubbing his ear a lot and then Michael's rubbing his ear a lot. And <laughs> suddenly Michael's imitating everything he's doing, you know, and, and it's amazing because literally, you know, three days later when we had our first rehearsal, we go into... You know, starting to do a scene, and you know, I I hadn't seen Birdman yet. Tom had seen Birdman, so he knew. And you know, look, I love Michael Keaton. I grew up with I'm Batman, the whole thing, right? <laughs> but you know, it was amazing because we do this first scene, and Michael walks in, and he's Michael Keaton. He, he, you know, he's got that little twitchy, you know, Michael Keaton thing. And suddenly he goes to read, and he goes, he like literally transforms. You know, Robbie, yeah, and starts talking with the accent, and it was amazing. Uh, <laughs> And so all of them, you know, Sasha talks about how Rachel would like walk behind her as they, they saw, Rachel went and spent like, you know, two or three days with Sasha in Boston. And Sasha talks how about how Rachel would keep slipping behind her. And she would be like, what, what is she doing? And she realized that Rachel was studying her gait, literally watching the way she walked. Uh, and not to mention she would call and say, you know, what, what nail polish did you wear? What, you know, wow. what perfume, what, 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 you know, how did you brush your hair? You know, what kind of shoes, everything. Uh, did you wear a watch? How did you take notes? You know, um, and so there were it really down to the most minute detail. And if you realize like Boston is such a unique place to live, it would have been inauthentic. People would have noticed even subconsciously like, no, that's not something she would wear or you know. Yeah, and, and again, I think it really goes back to Tom and his, you know, it, it goes back to what he pushed us to do in script, right, really nailing this, but also what he did in, in, in direction. You know, if you look closely, the camera moves, and the camera moves incredibly elegantly and gracefully, and the composition is lovely, right? It's just almost invisible because he's trying to put you in there in a very realistic way, right? He's trying, he's echoing, you know, Lumet. You know, and, and the great directors of the 70s who were literally trying to put you in the room and not get between you and what's happening on screen, right? To get that sort of real sense of, uh, almost a visceral sense of being there. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it, you know it's, it's not, you know, like you go and see The Revenant, like, okay, you can see the camera, right? It's great, right? Like, it's beautiful. And you feel the camera is, you know, someone who works on the, sh on the movie said, yeah, the camera is almost a character. Right in the movie, and that's not what this is. Uh, but I think Tom does this incredibly lovely job of putting us in that room with them, so we feel it. And so when the come round happens on Robbie, what we're intending is for everyone to feel that. Right? What was my responsibility? Did I miss it? That's a great setup. I love the scene with Michael and uh, Leo Schreiber, where he says, "You know, Mike, oh, we pick our own team, you know, our own stories," and Leo just like. Would you consider this one? Would you consider picking this one? Because yeah. <laughs> I love that because he was obviously yeah. the player coach in charge. And, and I like the twist there, but I also like the fact that Robbie respected it at the end. Like, yeah. not the end, but even like he actually got in, enticed by the story in Act One. He's like, I, you know what? There is something here. I, so, Liev was incredible, right? I mean, I love Liev's performance because he's so, under, he's like the opposite of Ray Donovan, right? He's, you know, <laughs> people keep asking us, like, well, did you think about casting him? Because Ray Donovan also suffered <laughs> abuse, and, which, you know, didn't have anything to do with why we cast him. We cast him because he's an amazing actor. I mean, it's sort of ironic, I suppose. Um, but uh, Liev is so good. And I, what I love about that relationship is, you know, it starts with this very awkward dinner, which we right. see at the top of the film. And then there's the moment of Catholic charities where you realize these are brothers in arms. They're really now, you know, fighting this, you know, massive institution together. And then at the end where Robbie sort of is having this, you know, moment of could I have done more? Should I have done more? You know, it's only Marty really who can give him that benediction. And, right. and those words where Marty says, you know, uh, you know, 
as reporters, we stumble around in the dark a lot, you know, and you know, and the lights turn on, and there's a lot of blame to go around. Those are Marty's words. You know, some of the, you know, a lot of, I would say, the language in the movie is stuff that, you know, I, I couldn't make up, right? Tom couldn't make up, you know, and in fact, like, you know, having the tapes of Phil Saviano, when Tom goes to write that scene for the first time, he's, he's just taking, he's transcribing, you know, and then cleaning up for a lot, of, because you want those survivors to sound like, you know, not like Law and Order SVU, where you're just making it up on the fly. Where you have the time, you want to actually, you know, make it sound like Phil Saviano. And say, you know, when I wrote the Crowley scenes for the first time, like, I took our tapes, and I said, how can I, how can I literally use his language so it feels real in a way that, you know, wouldn't otherwise. See, I'm going to quote that line. I'm just curious. So uh, when, he, when Phil says, how do you say no to God, this is not just physical abuse, it's spiritual abuse, too. You brought, what the priest does to you, that he robbed you of your faith. So that's directly from Phil, basically? Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. And in fact, you know, Phil was very useful because we really wanted to get, you know, the survivor stuff right. So Phil, we also went back to, had him read the whole script, had him mark up his scenes. He was actually there on the day working with me and Neil Huff. Like, literally, and there's, there's uh, language in there about grooming, right, which is very important language to survivors. And we made it a point, you know, Phil, Phil was like, we want to get this language in there because that is a message that's something we preach, something we talk about. And so we actually worked to get that language into the speech, which it wasn't there before. Now, Rachel's character obviously uh, deals a lot with the victims. So is that something you guys decided, Lenny and Hart, she would be focusing a little more on the victims, or is that just the way it happened on That's the team? sort of the way it happened yeah. on the team. I mean, the way, it, the, way the, the, the work split up is Mike literally took Garabedian. Mike literally was the crazy man who said, I'm going to stick with the, you know, the, the somewhat tetchy, uh, difficult, you know. Uh, and Tucci does such a great job of sort of capturing that essence. And in fact, Mitch, it's very funny because Mitch was very, you know, did not want us, didn't really want to be involved with the production. He was, you know, threatened to sue us a couple times over. To, I mean, literally we had, there was a line of his that was printed. Somebody at the Globe in the names column got a hold of the script and printed one of Mitch's lines, a line that Tom and I loved. And Mitch set him to sue us over the line. So we had to adjust the line, which is something that Tom's still not forgiven the names column in Boston for. Uh, but, uh, but what was amazing was Mitch came to our opening night in Boston and he loved the film. And which, you know, I, I don't know what higher praise there is really. Uh, and in fact, a couple days later, he and Phil Saviano were then on local television sort of pushing, you know, pushing their, their you know, what they've been fighting for for years, which was really lovely. Um, and, and that's been actually a pretty, you know, I, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, uh, the Papal Commission on Abuse uh, is meeting for a three-day session, and they opened the session by screening our film. Oh, that's nice. and, uh, and to me, I mean, you know, the, 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 they've, they've said a lot of the right things, but they need to do more, and the idea that this might prod them to do more is something that, you know, we're all super excited about. The, uh, and the other side of the story, which I, especially with Rachel's character, the grandmother, because yeah. you know the, the fact that because you know I you know uh, my grandmother read the Long Island Catholic and she would not go to a movie right. unless it approved. This is the concept of how destroyed the average person was that they, they would deport priests. So this is something you was that based on uh, grandmother or you yeah, want so something to add the other side of the story? So Rachel, uh, so first of all, Rachel is wonderful. And I, and I think like, you know, to me that was a real, uh, I mean, when we got her on board, that was sort of, she was sort of the final piece that made the film go forward. And to me, she's sort of the emotional through line. You know, uh, I, I guess saying Rachel McAdams is the emotional through line of the film is sort of like stating the obvious. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, she's always going to be the emotional through line, but she's really wonderful, and the acting she does here is so subtle. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's really nice to see her getting such recognition. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, with the way the work was divvied up, you know, Mike was on Garabedi, and, and you know, uh, Sasha and Robbie were sort of looking at sort of the, the bigger picture, 70 Priests, and Rachel, you know, Mike was good at talking to survivors, and so was Robbie. Rachel, I think, was really superlative, and it, it's funny, it's I think it's not just because she's, you know, I, sorry, Sasha was super low. And I think it's not just because Sasha is just an incredible listener, but she's also got this very piercing intellect and this very reporter's like, I will go there mentality. Mm -hmm. And she was very adamant when, when, when we were talking to her, you got to make it clear molest is not a four letter word, right? Like there are all sorts of different kinds. And we have her do that in the movie and get very specific, which I think, you know, tells you a lot about who Sasha Pfeiffer is and the way she approaches story. 
Um, you know, but it's true, Sasha, you know, all of them were lapsed Catholics, you know, but Sasha was the one who her mother in Ohio was still practicing. Mm -hmm. Sasha was actually a, 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 I'd never understand, you know, uh, go, tw go twice on Sunday. Sasha literally had to go to church twice on Sundays because <laughs> her father was Presbyterian and her mother was Catholic. So she literally had to go to two masses every Sunday. Uh, and that's the tradition she was brought up in. And her grandmother in, in Southie was, you know, full on ca South, Southie Catholic. And that's where Sasha spent her summers. She loved it. She came, went to BU. Like she was someone who sort of grew up in this culture in a major way. And so, you know, I think it was really challenging for her, you know, both the grandmother, right, and also her mom. And in fact, mm -hmm. her mom came to the Boston premiere, and she was, Sasha was very nervous about that. <laughs> and again, it was one of the, you know, the, the, the two highest praise, Garabedean that night, and also her mother, who, you know, approved of the film, which was shocking. <laughs> And speaking of Rachel's performance, that scene with Joe Crawley, you know, when he, Joe Crawley has a great line, first time in my life someone told me it was okay to be gay and it was a priest. Right. But you're juxtaposing that with the other bad guy, the, 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 the tough Boston guy who also was. Is yeah. that something you want to show, making sure, like, shows that the, uh, the priest went after everyone? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, what I, what, I, what I love about those two is they're both very different and very similar, right? They're very different than one is gay and one is straight, right? And one is, you know, they're from different parts of Boston, um, you know, and they're clearly different guys, you know, uh, uh, and yet very similar in that, you know, both from broken homes, poor broken homes, both without a support system to protect them uh, and really anyone to turn to, and both wound up struggling tremendously, Joe with alcohol and, uh, and Patrick uh, with, uh, with other substances. And, you know, and so... The, the, the similarities, and that's what Mike points to after, what Ruffalo does in the film, you know, these priests were predators, and they're really going after, they're pulling off the weak from the pack, yeah. right? And they're going after, and, you know, they're going after girls, but they're really going after boys because boys are less likely to complain, less likely to cry out because they're so ashamed. And, you know, that's another thing that is similar in both. They're clearly both ashamed of what's happened and it's clearly scarred them in that, in that way that, you know, it's tough for them to talk. And actually, the other scene with Rachel was when she bangs on the door of the priest. Yeah. Uh, when the, the priest, who had no, you know, it's like, well, I didn't get any gratification, so it was okay. And I know it was like, to right. That's not, does that something surprise you in the research that there was priests would actually be that admitting it and the, clueless to what they've done? Yeah, that scene was a pretty late ad. So Tom, we sort of had a full script, and Tom was like, I think we need a scene with a priest. And I was very resistant because I was like, how are we going to have one priest? that sums up all of the bad priests out there. Um, and Tom's like, well, just go look at the research and see if there's a, you know, this is, you know, this is writer, director. Yeah, just go, you know, make me something, right? So uh, I go and I look at the research and I find, and I knew there were two priests that Sasha had told me about interviewing around the time of our story, you know, or, you know shortly thereafter. And, uh, and this priest, uh, you know, Pat, when, you know, I read the, the, the news, you know, the, the article, and the, the quotes are verbatim, right? The, I didn't get any gratification, I was just sure I fooled around, like, it's all verbatim. And so you read that, and you're like, oh, okay, maybe this will make a good scene, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, and not to mention, you know, just imagining Sasha having to take that in, and both the exhilaration at, oh my God, I've got this incredible, you know, article, and the horror of what he's saying. And the other thing I loved about it was that, you know, Paquin claimed, he said, you know, I never raped anyone. I should know I was raped, which I thought was fascinating because, you know, sure, these priests are, again, bad actors, but they're also products of the system. And a lot of them are products of the system that they were brought up in. And so being able to point to that a little bit felt like, okay, this could be an interesting representative of this class. Uh, and so, you know, we went and we, we wrote the scene, and Rachel just was incredible, like on the day, you know, watching her. And, you know, Tom cast, the, the fellow who plays Paquin is a local out of, actor out of Boston. I literally was in the casting room up in Boston, and this guy walks in, and Tom casts him, and he's wonderful, right? And, and so it speaks to Tom's ability, right, to cast Rachel McAdams on the one hand and get her to come play with us, and to cast some guy out of Boston who's not, a, you know, a, who's not, doesn't have a lot of film and TV experience, 
and to get equally outstanding performances from both of them, right? And to put them in a situation where, you know, on the day I watched that scene play out and I was like, this is going to be amazing. It's one of my favorite scenes in the, in, in the movie. And it, well, I know you'd have to show the other side just so dramatically, but Rachel's expression. Oh, like you said, geez. the horror, you did see this a little bit, but like the audience, we all felt the same thing. It's like, what? Yeah. Unbelievable. And it's... Yeah, I got to say, I was, I, was, I was, you know, we've had a lot of highs and a lot of, and we've had some ups and downs, but we've had a lot of good highs. And one of the best ones was the other night when uh, the actors won the SAG uh -huh. Ensemble Award. And it just felt like such a well-deserved award because they're all so good and the performances are all so subtle. And it's something that is not typically rewarded. Uh -huh. And so to see that recognized was just really thrilling. Yeah, the special team. So let's talk about other things. You, uh, you had a lot of scenes with research. You had the phone calls, the spreadsheets. Yeah. I got to say, generally, these are screenwriting no-nos. But you pulled it off. How did you guys do it? Uh, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, that's uh, very kind of you, first <laughs> of all. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the directory montage scene, some of them is montages I'm sort of proud of because, you know, it, Tom, I don't think had done a lot of montages in the past in his movies, and I had, you know, you know, television is a great place to learn, and you know, so one of the places where I got to learn for a little while was a place called Fringe, which was a, a TV show. There was a J.J. Abrams show, uh, Kurtzman Orsi show, uh, which was a fun sci-fi show, and just watching how J.J. writes because they all write the way, they all sort of came up in the J.J. camp, watching how he writes action. And if you look at the Star Wars script, you'll see the same thing. It's, you know, it's, it's lots of, you know, capital letters and bold and <laughs> curses and, you know, it gets you going on the script. And so, and so I just did the same thing with the directory. So I was like, they're looking at directories and they turn a line and unassigned and sick leave, you know. So I literally, that's why you can look at the page and it's, you know, I'm writing a script on Neil Armstrong now. It's, you know, it's all capital letters and bold. It's crazy. Um, Apollo goes for the moon. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, you know, I took a crack at that the first time. You know, Tom's like, how's this going to look? I'm like, let me take a crack at it. I took a crack at it. He's like, oh, that's interesting. And it was fun because he was like, well, what if we do instead of, because I, in the first draft, was like, it was like, you see, you know, you see them, you, you know, you see the ruler and you see going down the page and then you see the, see Mike and then you see the ruler and then you see Sasha and then you see ruler and then you see, and he's like, well, what if you just start with the ruler, 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 like just all sorts of different ways, you know, going through and then we see the people and then we pull back, which I thought was really brilliant visually because you start small and then you go a little bigger and then you go a little bigger, right? Which is also what they're doing, right? They started with a small number of priests and they're going to a much bigger number of priests. So it was, I feel like it was a good, again, this is sort of like the way our collaboration worked, right? You know, uh, you know we really had this great back and forth. And so I feel like, I feel lucky that I was able to contribute to that. And then Tom just pulled it off. I mean, those shots, you know, they're, they're, they drive, and, and also a shout out to Masanobu Takeanagi, who's our uh, DP, because they look gorgeous. That shot where you come up on Rachel, I mean, oh, it's gorgeous, right? It's just, it's a, it's, it's, it would be a beautiful picture, right? And the shot of, you know, there's a shot of, uh, of, of Brian Darcy James, Matt Carroll. When he's working, you see his reflection in the window. Like, they're all beautiful composition. And that also, I think, helps a lot. Yeah, you mentioned it before. It makes it feel like I'm in the room. Right. Like, I'm feeling what Rachel's. I'm looking up from the right. screen like you right. and I would be. Right. Uh, so you, we touched a little bit about Robbie because, uh, you know, the great line, which story do you want us to write, the degenerate priest or the lawyers turning abuse of the cottage industry, was a great line. But I really like the reversal right after where the lawyer turns around like, but I did give you the information. Right. So was that for you? That was like, did you work on Robbie's arc when he realized that he was a part of the problem? Or yeah, so, so was this was actually a late find. So we, um, we, from the very beginning, we had a sense that the Globe was somewhat complicit because there are a number of other stories and anecdotes that suggest that. Um, and we were told them pretty early on. You know, Mike told me a bunch, and then Robbie reiterated. And these are anecdotes that you know, pretty much everyone we talked to told us about. The, the story about law calling down the wrath of God on the globe, we heard that from everyone we talked to. It, you know, literally, we would talk to like randoms you know, who had nothing to do. You know, law called down the wrath of God. You know, like that is a very <laughs> famous story, and it's in the globe. And, you know, and so there are all these different stories that suggested some level of complicity. But we didn't have the story of the 20 priests, right? And, you know, we actually had a full script. And we had talked to Bob Sherman, who was Eric McLeish's partner. Eric McLeish is played by Billy Crudup. He's the, the, the counterpart in this scene. 
And, uh, you know, so we didn't have, you know, Eric's, uh, we didn't, we hadn't sat with Eric. And Tom's like, let's go sit with Eric. And I was like, I don't know, like, the guy's just going to spin us, right? He's a lawyer. He doesn't look particularly good. You know, he ran this cottage industry. Why should we sit and talk with him? And Tom said, you know, I want to, I got to cast him. I want to see what he looks like. I want to see how he sounds. Like, at the very least, we'll get that. And so we went and we sat with him, you know, and of course he did try to spin us and, you know, said, well, they were good, but I'm the real hero, you know, like a little bit of that. Um, and I, it wasn't really like that. It wasn't nearly that bad. It probably is in my head because that's how I went into the, the meeting. Um, but, you know, and in fact, he did, you know, play a big role in the Porter case and then, you know, sort of started selling it, settling these things quietly. And, and, you know, we said, well, but you settled these things quietly. And he said, well, some people want quiet settlements. But he said, but also, I tried to go to the press. He said, I, I gave them 20. It was literally the, com the conversation Robbie has is the conversation we had with him. I gave them 20 priests. And Tom and I sort of look at each other and we don't say anything. He's like, yeah, I sent them a letter and they buried it. And we, again, Tom and I, you know, we walk out of the room. And we're like, that can't be true. We're like, that, <laughs> there's no way. You know, and I in particular was like, oh, I told you he was going to spin us. He's so full of, you know. And I go back to the computer, you know, again, use the archive, went back to my computer, and the archive's online. If you're a member of the Globe, you can, you know, look at any articles back through the early 80s, late 70s. And I, you know, I check, I do a search in the archive for McLeish in 93. You know, end of 93, McLeish, you know, priest abuse. You know, I'd done searches like this a lot. And up pops this article. You know, uh, you know, lawyer for, you know, priest, you know, uh, uh, victim lawyer, you know, claim, claims 20 priests. And it was buried on page B42 of Metro. And then I went to the Bishop Accountability site, which is a tremendous archive, and, I, and they actually had the letter. And in the letter, he names Paquin, and he names Shanley, and he names some of the worst priests are in this letter. So he's got actual names of priests. And I couldn't believe it. I called Tom and I said, because at this point we're pretty close with Robbie and the other reporters. And, you know, and it's 93. And I, I don't think I even knew at that time. It was like two weeks after Robbie took over Metro. So Robbie's there, Ben's there, you know, and Mike and Sasha and Matt aren't involved. But like, you know, uh, you know, so I sheepishly email Robbie after Tom and I talked about it. And I say, you know, we found this article. What do you got to say? And Robbie said to us, what you know, Michael says in the movie. And he, he, he basically was, he didn't shy away. He said, I don't remember it at all, but it was on my watch, and we should have followed up on it. I like, and I like the twist where you got the great ride from Mark Ruffalo. It's time, Robbie, to publish a story. They knew it. They let it happen to kids. This could be you. It could have been me. It could have been any of us. Great line, but Michael still, even with his new knowledge that he was complicit, has to hold the story back because it's not ready yet. Yeah. Because that's something he's struggling with. He began to realize he's complicit, but at the same time, he had to bake the gamble of not publishing. Yeah, and I, and I think that, uh, you know, w what I love about that scene and the scene with Marty earlier where he says, I don't care how many priests we have, I want to go after the system, is uh, what I love about those two scenes is, is I think they say a lot about the newsroom and the importance of the newsroom. Like, you know, a lot of people say, well... Yeah, sure, newspapers go out of business, but there's so much information out there, right, online and, you know. But there's a difference between information that's just thrown up on the web and information that actually goes through a newsroom. Because I think when it goes through a newsroom, there is a set of eyes, there is a set of ethics, there is a, a craft in terms of how we present stories. And, you know, the, the, you know, David Simon has said some of the best stories, you know, we ever ran with were stories that were held. Because we didn't run with them right away. We actually took a beat and we actually got the whole story, and so hence knew how to position it. And frankly, I think if they hadn't held, you know, the, the 70 priest story ran uh, on the 24th, and the, uh, the 24th of January in 2002, and the, the story on the letters, you know, ran on the 6th. So it, you literally, you know, 18 days later, less than three weeks later, and it was really like a one-two punch, right? And, and I think without the 70 priest story running that quickly behind, I don't know if this blows wide open and, and goes nationally and then internationally. And it was because, A, they, they got it, and then they held and got the second piece. You know, so not only did they have the depth, right? This went back 20 years, 30 years, and Cardinal Law knew and did nothing, but the breadth. And it was not just one priest, it was 70. That, all of a sudden, you see, oh my, that's the system. So, and, and that was, and by the way, it was challenging, like, th that sort of dual 
you know, we have a lot of different things going on in this story. We have, you know, we have the letters story that comes out of Garabin. We have the 70 priest story that comes out of Robbie and Sasha's work, you know, and, and, the, and the interaction with Jim Sullivan. You know, we have the legal case going on at the same time. And, you know, it, it, there was sometimes a question of can we keep all these balls in the air? And yet we thought they were super important to understanding what these guys did. Yeah, so how do you decide to end it? Because we have the payoff of watching the grandmother read the story with Rachel. Uh, Stanley Tucci, you know, yay, Stanley Tucci wins, but there's two more victims, Ray, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you had the spotlight getting all the phone calls. Is that how you wanted, like, you had to tie everything up, but it also realized it's far from over? I yeah, I, you know, it's funny, because we, we had a lot more beats leading up to the phone calls, and the first time I, because I was at that point writing ahead and Tom was running behind me, and the first time I wrote towards the, towards the end of the third act, I just, you know, it was clear we wanted to drive harder, so we didn't Mozart the end, if you will. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I will say, you know, we always sort of thought if we could set it up properly, that phone moment would be incredible. Because there had been such history of picketing and pushing back. When, when they ran the bus, there were stories about busing in the, in the 70s. Uh, that there were literally people, there were picketers, there were stones thrown into the globe. Somebody took a shot at one of the windows. I mean, it was, it was chaos. And they all thought that was going to happen. You know, and that's what they literally did have extra, you know, they had a little bit of security and some extra people on the desk ready for that on that Sunday. And the fact that it got up there and was quiet, right, and then they go downstairs and the phones are off the hook. I mean, what I love about that, what I love about there's that great pan up from Brian up to Michael's face, and you're close enough to Michael's face. And what I love about it is, again, it's the triumph. We got it. We got this story. Look at, look at all these survivors who are now coming forward and the horror. Look at all these survivors who are coming forward, and, and, and they're coming forward now, and maybe I should have got it earlier. I mean, all of that is, is melded into that moment. Um, and again, talking about direction, like, it's if you, I, I've watched that scene a couple of times now. Uh, and, uh, and if you watch, you know, so you have Mike and Robbie coming into the, into the, into the, uh, uh, the bullpen, the, the newsroom, and you see them coming in your wide, and they're in the left of frame. Right? And, and the camera just holds on them talking from far away to, you know, to the woman at the desk. Best overtime I have made, right? And then, they, and then they get excited and they, oh, spotlight, and they start walking and then start running. And the camera just moves with them. And then they run out of the camera's frame and you land on Marty, right? Who's still in that office, which I just, I love. It's just, it's so subtle. And you, you capture and there's nobody there except them. There's something really powerful. And then next you pick the camera, follow, pulling them down the hall. Right, again, this movement that you feel the energy, now it's even faster, you're with them, and you take them into the room, and now you're bopping back and forth between, you know, in, the clo in sort of the medium shots, right, of all, all of the characters as they're trying to process and trying to deal, and then you swing up to that incredibly close shot of Robbie, and that's where you feel it in this big way. So again, you've got this far remove, you know, and you follow, you see in the distance Marty, and then you're moving closer with them, and then you're finally up in Robbie's face. And again, such subtle camera work and such subtle choices that Tom's making to drive home that final moment. All right, we have time for just a couple of questions before we get to our reception. Oh, we seem to have one. Uh, let's go here. Uh, the other right, the other right here. Right behind uh, you. And then we'll get you. We'll get you. Uh, Great film. Th thank you for the film. Thank you. Uh, one of the things, you know, a fair amount has been written about the scandal. Uh, one of the th couple of things that the movie drives that I've never seen before was the nature, the spiritual nature of the abuse on the victim, which was, which was interesting and I think something you just hadn't thought of before. Uh, but also the kind of spiritual toll taken on the city. That blew me away. I remember, this is the thing we talked about. I said, who's ever done that before? My question for you is how pervasive was that feeling when you talk to people in Boston that there's real, there was a real cost, a spiritual cost to the people of the city? You know, we, you know, it's funny. Some of the early interviews we did, which you know, were not as useful for the procedural, were incredibly useful thematically. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time, had a long conversation with uh, John Albano, who was the lawyer uh, uh, for the Globe, uh, outside counsel, who went and, you know, and his assistant, Tony Fuller who actually played a role in, uh, in getting the lawyer to refile, getting uh, the, the court to refile the exhibits. Um, and it's interesting because I, I spent, you know, probably a half an hour to an hour on the legal mumbo jumbo, most of which didn't wind up in the film. Uh, but then I spent a good hour and a half with both of them just talking about what it was like growing up Catholic and what it was like now, 
right? And and John had grown up in Worcester, you know, uh, uh, and, and small town, you know, and, and again, talking about how these towns are so Catholic and how the priest is God and talking, sort of reiterating what Phil had said about the spiritual abuse. Uh, and Tony, who's still a practicing Catholic, had talked about going away and then coming back to the church and how hard it is and how challenging it is even now, you know, in terms of how do you manage your feelings and how do you manage, and, and it really does feel like, you know, uh, you know, we debated for a while about leaving 9-11 in there, um, just because you can imagine pulling it out and the story's still working, but it was such an important event and it was so key and it felt like well, we're trying to do, be authentic, how do we not leave it in there? But beyond that, thematically, 9-11 I think was a breaking for all of us, right? Like, at least it was, was for me, like I suddenly looked at the world in a different way and to us, thematically, very similar to this moment for the city of Boston. So I think that was very real and pervasive, and I think it's something that, you know, I think Catholics are still struggling with, frankly. Oh, right there. Here's it. Great film. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that the characters, the individuals, the original individuals were on set a lot. I'd be curious as to your, set, your take on, were they all pleased with their depictions? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, uh, you know, ultimately, yes. And in fact, that was, that was, that was one of, another big nervous moment. We showed the film first to Marty, uh, and in fact, it's sort of funny. So Marty uh, comes, because Marty's in DC now, working for the Washington Post, uh, and he came up to New York uh, before we screen it for the rest of the reporters in Boston. Again, like, let the slightly more objective guy take a look first, <laughs> uh, who's not in the film quite as much. Uh, um, and again, they were all on set so much, we weren't super nervous, but we were pretty nervous nonetheless. Marty comes up and he brings uh, one of his good friends, who's like this long time, 20 year investigative reporter, like well known, like at the Times and the Post. And so now we're like doubly nervous because we've got Marty and this, you know, you know, real deal investigative reporter. And uh, they watch the film and they come out and uh, they clearly both thought we'd got the journalism right, which was really nice. Um, and, but the guy who was Marty's long term friend said, you know, I will say the only thing that bothered me a little is, you know, uh, you know, Marty, you know, is is a little warmer and a little, you know, and 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 is, you know, a little more jokey and you know, less sort of stiff uh, than you've depicted him. And Marty just shook his head and said, "I wasn't then." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and it's true. He apparent, Marty apparently had a little uh, post-it by his desk which said, "I am not warm and fuzzy," which somebody had given it to him. <laughs> You know, and, and so, and, and fortunately, like, the rest of it went down uh, in that way with the other reporters. They were both, uh, they were all, you know, uh, I think we've been very fortunate in that way. And, and it really, again, speaks to uh, the attention Tom forced us to take to detail, you know, at the script and then the attention he focused on detail uh, at the film stage as well. All right, we have one more question, so. There, there. Your efforts are truly commendable. Uh, I wonder, during the course of this research, have you focused on other religion, for example, Islam and Judaism? I mean, uh, before coming here, I read an article by, I don't know him, Reverend Ted Pike on published March of March 2nd of last year, that refers uh, to the abuse of children as, use, as young as three years old. So have you looked at? Yeah, so, you know, uh, you know, given the scope of our story, we focused mostly on, you know, we focused um, exclusively on uh, clergy sex abuse within the Catholic Church. Uh, but certainly, you know, as a Jew, uh, I've heard of this within certain Orthodox communities, and that bothers me quite a bit. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, abuse of children goes beyond, you know, the Catholic Church. And I think, you know, and I think that's part of why, you know, when we were focused on our theme, 
you know, the biggest theme we focused on was complicity and deference, right? We had all sorts of stories of the, of the globe, you know, turning a blind eye. Why did we focus on the story, you know, of the 20 priests and Ravi? Well, it's a great story, and, you know, it relates to our central protagonist, but because it relates to our central protagonist, we're trying to push it back to the audience, right? You know, trying to have everybody say, what have I missed? Because look at Penn State, Sandusky. Look at the BBC and Jimmy Savile. Look at Bill Cosby. How many people enabled those things to go on and on for years? This is something we don't like to talk about. We don't like to think about. I mean, even if you look at the coverage of this movie, there's been a lot of talk in the papers about journalism and, you know, the fall off of journalism and how we need this kind of journalism, which is great and we're thrilled about. But there hasn't been much coverage about what has the church done? And is the church really stopping this from happening, right? I think people don't want to look at it. And I think it's something we all need to look harder at and to be willing to talk about. Um, and to the students in the audience, I, I think you guys are the generation who's ready to have those conversations, you know, from everything I've seen about the conversations you guys are willing to have. Like those, it's very impressive. You know, you guys feel very mature. I, I certainly wasn't ready to have conversations about transgender when I was in, you know, when I was in college, right? And I'm, I'm so proud of the youth of today that they can have those conversations, right? And maybe you'll push all of us old geezers <laughs> to have conversations <laughs> about abuse, right? And to, and to bring this out in the open so that it can't continue. I, I think that's a great question. Thanks okay. for asking it. Uh, well, we always end our uh, Q&As with the same question. Can you tell us perhaps a childhood movie theater experience you had or going with your family, a movie that kind of like really struck you or a whole experience uh, when you were uh, You know, it's funny. I think the first memory of going to the theater, uh, uh, well, I have two. Uh, my father took me to see Star Trek, the first Star Trek, and that was a good <laughs> memory. But I, I was actually, I got to that because I remember the lines for Empire Strikes Back. And I remember waiting in those lines. But, you know, as, as a kid, you know, I just, I just loved, uh, you know, I loved movies that pushed to something bigger. You know, Glory was one of my very favorite movies, you know, because of the things it was trying to say about race. And, and it was such a beautiful depiction of this regiment, uh, you know. But I also love movies like The Natural, which are just trying to say things about good, it's just trying, trying to say something about good and evil. Um, and, you know, I happen to love baseball. So, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, 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 you know I, 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 I love movies because hopefully they can get us talking about important issues. Um, you know, hopefully they entertain us and take us for a good ride, and I think this is a pretty good ride here, this detective story. But hopefully also gets us talking and thinking about issues as a society, so. Yeah, I just gotta say about that, uh, too long the victims of church abuse scandal and the victims of sex abuse in general are only viewed as statistics. Because uh, we, we don't wanna face what they even think about. Uh, this film gave the victims a face and a voice, so we can't no longer sweep it under the rug. So I do commend you as a screenwriter going to this really dark place for a couple of years, every day willing to write so their stories can be told. So well, thank you very we much. wish, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we wish you luck at the Oscars. We hope you win. <laughs> but also it gives another chance for the voice to be told again. There you stories. go. There so you thank go. you. And thanks very thanks much. Thanks for coming out.